And so we're going to spend the next couple of months unpacking this book. Now, this morning is going to be a little more teaching than preaching, okay? So I know, listen, I like to preach. I like to get fired up and pace around the stage. But this morning, I'm going to teach a little bit. And I want to lay some groundwork for you because there's some things we have to understand if we're going to walk through this together. Okay, there's three ground rules I want to give you. The first one is this. My goal in this series is not to convince you that I am right. Believe it or not, that is not my goal in this series. Now, I'm going to give you scripture. I'm going to give you some history. I'm going to try to give you some context. My goal is not to convince you that I am right, but my goal is to convince you to find truth for yourself. See, I think the biggest mistake we make sometimes think, well, I'm just going go to go to church and the pastor's going to feed me. You ever heard that before? Well, I just wasn't getting fed at that church. Listen, some of you have been Christians for 20 years. You don't need to be spoon fed anymore. You can feed yourself. What my goal is, is really to push you and to challenge you to, to discover truth for yourself. I actually had a conversation this week with a friend of mine who is going through this faith journey where, where he's really questioning everything, and right now he's not sure that God exists. It breaks my heart. But I told him, here's the thing that I love about the questions you're asking, is because you're pursuing the truth. And as a Christian, we should always pursue truth, right? Because Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. And so if we pursue truth, I, I firmly believe we'll always end up back at Jesus. And so that's what I hope for you, that you would pursue truth. Now, the, the second thing I'm going to tell you is my goal is not to offend you. I, I got to say that up front, because I'm sure at some point I'm going to say something that's going to offend somebody. But my goal is to make you uncomfortable. I want to challenge some assumptions that you've held. And, and again, it's not for the purpose of you agreeing with me, but we never grow when we're comfortable. That's never how growth happens. Anybody here ever been to the gym before? Like one person? Okay, good. That's good. You're my people, all right? See, I don't go to the gym very much, so I'm not, I don't have firsthand experience with this, but I'm told that when you go to the gym, it's not always comfortable. Like if you want to grow big muscles, you got to like, you got to stretch the muscles. You got to break them down. You got to, you got to put them under duress. And in the same way, I think sometimes we get so comfortable spiritually, we don't want to be stretched. We, we, don't, we don't want to be challenged can I just tell you that the times in my life where I have grown the most have been in the, the biggest seasons of stretching. Now, there are seasons where we need to take a break, right? You don't need to go to the gym 24 hours a day. Amen? Yeah. But, but it is good to have a season of stretching. And so that's my goal is to make you a little uncomfortable. So, so if I offend you, I apologize. That, that's not my intent. But my intent is to, to stretch you, to challenge you, to help you grow. And the third thing, the third thing is just know we're not going to have time to go verse by verse through the book of Revelation. That'd take us like two years. And as fascinating as that sounds to me, I'm sure that if you want to do that, we can go through a life group together. We can dive in really deep. But what I do want to do is I'm going to walk through the book of Revelation in chunks because there is an overarching story and message in the book of Revelation. And so we're going to look at, at chunks of chapters at a time. We'll look at a few verses. We're going to dive in a little bit. Um, but again, my hope is really that, that what we do on Sunday morning is just a diving board for you to go even deeper in your faith, deeper in your walk with Jesus. Does that sound good? All right, so that brings us to the question, man, we fired up this morning. I like it. I'm not even preaching. I'm ready to start pacing back and forth. But, but we're saying, okay, this is what revelation is not. It's not this weird thing. It's not this thing to avoid. Well, what is revelation? Now, if you're taking notes, and I would encourage you, even if you don't normally take notes, pull out your phone. I want to give you four questions that you need to ask yourself when reading any book of the Bible. This is Bible 101. This is how you read the Bible. You ready? The first question you need to ask is, what is the context? Okay, so who's writing this? Who's it written to? What's going on at the time? And I know you're thinking, well, I just want to pull up my Bible. I just want to read a verse and be inspired for the day. I get it. But if we don't read it in context, which is like the old preacher story. You ever heard this one before? The guy says, Jesus, give me a word for the day. And he opens up his Bible and points and says, Judas went out and hung himself. The guy thinks, well, that can't be what Jesus wants me to do. Let me try again. Jesus, help me with the word for today. He points, go and do likewise. Okay, you know, like we can pull scripture out of context. We can make verses say anything they want, but the goal is to read it in context. See, the Bible was not written to you, but it was written for you. It's a big distinction to make. The Bible was written for you. It's written for our benefit so that we would learn and we would grow, but it wasn't written to us. The Bible isn't one book. It's a collection of books and letters collected over hundreds of years, written by several different authors in different languages. And the Bible has a message, but it has a message for people in that time. We have to understand what is the context. 
then we can ask ourselves the second question, what is the message? What was that author trying to teach to the original audience in their situation? And once we understand that message, then we can ask ourselves, what's the principle? What's the timeless principle that we can take from that message and then apply to our lives, which is the last question, what is the application? So you think a lot of times we want to just ask that last question, what's the application? And we, we read verses like, you know, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord's plans to prosper you. Right? You know, that, that wasn't written to you. That was written to ancient Israelites. Now, I do think that God has plans for us, but I mean, ask the very first Christians who were martyrs, what, what did prospering look like to them? It didn't look like a big bank account and a safe family and a two-car garage in the suburbs, you know? Like, we got to dive a little bit deeper. We can't just jump to the application. So this morning, I kind of want to walk through that grid a little bit and help us to understand the context and the message, and then that'll help us over the next few weeks to kind of take those principles and apply them. Does that sound good? Now, I want to point out, like I try to do every week, sometimes I forget, there's a number on the screen. If you're watching online, there's a number on the screen. And if you have questions, and I'm sure you will have questions, text into that, that number, and during the message, I'll set aside time at the end to answer your questions. I've already anticipated that we're going to get way more questions than I can answer at the end of a message. So we have a whole week set aside at the end of this series for Q&A. So if I don't get to your question today, we're not ignoring it. We will get to it in just a few weeks. So, so please text in those questions. It's a lot more fun when you put the pastor on the hot seat at the end of the sermon every week. Now, having said that, let's jump in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. This series is like three years in the making, so I'm excited now. We're about, to, we're about to jump in. Verse one, the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, whatever he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it, because the time is near. And there's a lot to unpack in three verses. Here's just a few things I want to point out in these first verses. It says this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, this was originally written in Greek, and the Greek word for revelation there is, is the word where we get our word apocalypse. Now, when, when I say apocalypse, what do you guys think about? Zombies, there we go, that's a good one. What else? You guys are kind of murmuring, I can't hear. Did somebody say snow? I don't know. It's a, a global warming, I don't know. We, we, we got apocalypse, but what you're thinking of, you're thinking the end of the world, right? Everything has gone haywire. In fact, when we do get a snowstorm in Georgia, we say this is a, a, an apocalyptic storm, right? Like we get, we get half an inch on the ground, everybody's in their house for three weeks, right? Like we just don't know how to deal with it. And, and that's okay, by the way. It's okay, we don't have to deal with it. But the word apocalypse actually doesn't mean end of the world. The word apocalypse means unveiling or revealing. That's why we translate it as revelation. It's revealing something. So, so that's where we get the title revelation. By the way, everybody say revelation. revelation. All right, it's singular now. Don't be saying revelations anymore. All right, this is the book of revelations. It's one revelation. It's revealing something to us about Jesus. So whatever else the book is about, it's unveiling something about Jesus to a certain group of people because they need help for, what does it say? For what must soon take place. Man, a lot of times we skip over that part, what must soon take place. Because when we read the book, we're like, well, it's the end times and we got Apache helicopters and there's locusts and all this other stuff. But remember, this was written to a group of people who was about to endure something and they needed to know something about Jesus in order to make it through. And I know I've heard people say before, well, you know, a thousand days is, or a thousand years is like a day. And then, you know, all that jazz. And we say, okay, well, well, soon doesn't mean the same for them. Do we really think that Jesus gave a letter to a certain group of people and said, I'm giving this to you, but it's not for your benefit. And none of this is going to happen in your lifetime. This isn't going to help you at all. No, that doesn't make any sense. This is a, a unveiling of Jesus to help people for what must soon take place. Now we learned that this revelation, this unveiling, was given to a man named John. Now, there's some debate over who this John guy was, because what we're going to find out is this is actually addressed to seven churches, seven particular churches in the region of Asia Minor. 
And so one thought process is that this is actually a, a Jewish prophet who kind of went from town to town. He had converted to Christianity. He would go and encourage these churches and that he'd come under persecution for preaching Jesus. So he was exiled to the island of Patmos. Now, Patmos is, is an island that essentially was like Alcatraz. Okay, there's one way in, there's no way out. And it was a rock quarry, so it was a labor camp that they would actually, the Roman Empire would send people to when they kind of did the wrong things. And so John apparently was preaching Jesus. They told him to stop. He wouldn't, and they sent him to the island of Patmos. So that's one theory is that he's this kind of Jewish convert to Christianity who's kind of traveling around. Now, there's some textual evidence for that. What, what other scholars believe, and actually what a lot of the church fathers believed and some Roman historians even attested to, is that this is actually written by the apostle John, Jesus' disciple John. And the reason he's addressing it to these churches is because he kind of has some sway. He has some influence because I was a follower of Jesus. And he was exiled to the island of Patmos. He receives this vision, and he's uh, giving it to seven churches. Now, what on earth is going on at this time? There's two primary opinions on when this was written. The first one is that it was written in 65 AD, and if you want to talk about that, I can geek out with you on, on why people think that. But what, what, what I hold to and what a majority of, of, of scholars believe is that this was actually written in 95 AD. Okay, so it was written in the 90s. Not 1990s, not Saved by the Bell 90s, like actually the 90s. And in that time period, um, the Christians were undergoing intense persecution. And this is, by the way, this is why the dating doesn't really matter too much. Because in the 60s, uh, there was a guy ruling the Roman Empire named Nero. And Nero was not a nice guy. In fact, he became the emperor when he was a kid. And, uh, and he had these advisors. And even his own mom would kind of rule the empire through him. Well, when he became an adult, he said, I don't want anybody else telling me what to do. So he had his advisors assassinated. He had his own mom killed. So happy Mother's Day, right? So, so he didn't want anybody influencing him whatsoever. He actually wanted to rebuild Rome and make it better than it was. And so I don't know why his mind thought that way, but he said, I think I should burn down the city. So he starts a fire in a particular part of the city. And so imagine you wake up one morning, your house is on fire, your business is burned down, you've lost loved ones. I don't know why he decided to do this, but public sentiment turned against Nero pretty quickly. And so he decides to say, well, it wasn't me who started the fire. It was the Christians who started the fire. And so all of a sudden, for the first time, we have this um, intense, designed, government-sanctioned persecution against Christians. And, and Nero didn't go easy. In fact, there's some reports that he would have these dinner parties where he would actually, the way he would light his dinner parties, they didn't have like the little like string lights that they would kind of light up the courtyard. He would impale Christians on stakes, set them on fire, and those would be the torches through which he would light his dinner party. Not a nice guy, right? Now, he actually dies uh, around 68, and then a few years later, a guy named Domitian comes to power in Rome, and he picks up where Nero left off. So he's hunting down Christians, he's killing them, he's persecuting them. And so think about these seven churches. They've just come out of one intense season of persecution. Nero dies, they think God has saved us, and Domitian takes power, and it's starting all over again. I mean, even the most faithful of us, if you found out you were going to be persecuted again, that'd be exhausting. And so they're really wrestling with this question, what do I do in the face of persecution? Do, do I continue to be faithful knowing that it might cost me my life, or worse yet, it might cost my kids their lives, my spouse their lives, it might cost me my livelihood, I might give up everything I own to follow Jesus, or Maybe I could accommodate a little bit. Maybe I could just not be so Christian. Maybe I could kind of tone it down a little bit. I call it Mean Girls Christianity. You guys seen the movie Mean Girls? And I'd say, I'm not a cool mom. I'm a regular mom. It's like, oh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not one of those Christians. I'm, I'm a cool Christian. I'll just fit in with everybody else. And so there's this temptation. What do we do in the face of this intense persecution and so John gets this revelation, this unveiling of Jesus that is going to help these Christians survive that persecution, which is soon going to take place. Are we tracking? Okay, now that's very different 
than what many of us, or at least for me, what I grew up believing. I'm going to take kind of a, a side jaunt here. I don't know if jaunt is a word. It's like I'm very culturous. Is that a word? I don't know. Maybe I just made it up. But you, you, you grow up with this idea that the book of Revelation is all about what's going to happen in the future. Anybody here ever read the Left Behind books? Anybody? A few of us? All right, so you guys know Nikolai Carpathia, right? He's the Antichrist who's, of course, going to come out of Europe because Americans, we're never the bad guys, right? We're the heroes in the story. That was a joke, by the way. So, so we grow up with this idea that the book of Revelation is something that's going to happen in the future. And by the way, there have been people from the very beginning who believe that Revelation does have things to say about the future. But this idea that there's specific events and, and the locusts actually represent helicopters and all that stuff, there's actually a new, relatively new idea in the Christian faith. And so here's where I might step on some toes just a little bit. Because this idea of left behind theology, or, or the theological term is dispensationalism. Everybody say dispensationalism. I go, if you can learn how to order a mocha, choco, whatever at Starbucks, we can learn some theological terms, am I right? So this dispensationalism actually started in the 1800s. Okay, I'm going to give you three names. I might lose some of you here, but just stay with me. I think this is important. Three names I'm going to give you. The first one is John Nelson Darby, or Johnny Boy, as I like to call him. Now, now Johnny, I shouldn't do that. John Nelson Darby, he does deserve respect. Okay, I'm not going to do that. John Nelson Darby uh, enlisted very early on as an Anglican priest. Now, he became disillusioned with organized faith and organized church, and so he left the priesthood, and I would love to know what would have happened if he had had his life go the way he had planned, because actually everything went off track as soon as he left the priesthood. He actually got in a, a tragic horse riding accident. Is there like a more 1800s thing than somebody got in a horse riding accident? And he ended up in bed for two months. You know, it's 1800. He didn't have Facebook to be scrolling on his phone. He didn't have, you know, reruns of friends to watch and keep himself entertained. I mean, so, so all he had was to read the Bible. I mean, like, how bored do you have to be? Like, you're two months in bed, and you're like, well, I did everything else. I guess I'll read the Bible, you know? Like, that's how we approach it sometimes. But he starts reading this thing from cover to cover, and he gets to Revelation, and he reads that verse where it says, you know, these things must soon take place. And he said, well, it's about to take place. And so he starts reading in all these uh, visions of what God is trying to communicate. The end of the world is about to happen. Now, in 1831, he attends a conference where there's this guy named Edward Irving. That's the second name, all right? John Nelson Darby goes to a conference. He hears a guy named Edward Irving preaching. Now, Edward was a Presbyterian minister, but he actually later would get kicked out of the, the Presbyterian denomination because he was a little too Pentecostal because he believed that the end times were near, and the sign of the end times is that all the gifts of the Spirit would manifest themselves. So, so you'd be preaching in tongues, and there'd be people in tr trances and falling out. And so, I mean, you think you show up to one of his revivals, and it was crazy. I mean, I would love just to be a fly on the wall and see what was going on there. And so he actually goes to this conference, and he teaches about the end times, and he just kind of throws in this story that the year before in 1830, there was a 15-year-old girl named Margaret McDonald who was at one of his rallies, and she went into a trance for two hours. And when she came out of the trance, she said, I had a vision from the Lord that says that when he returns, there's going to be two times he returns. The first time, he's going to take all the Christians up to heaven with him, and there's going to be a great tribulation, and then he's going to return again, and he's going to reestablish Jerusalem and, and Israel and the temple, and, and everything's going to be set back the way it was in the Old Testament. So, Irving shares this story, and Darby hears this and says, that's it. That's the key to everything that I've been reading in Revelation. And so he starts to put together a theology, that dispensational theology, which teaches that in Scripture there are seven different dispensations. There's seven different time periods, and that ultimately there will be a rapture before the tribulation. Now, there's a few problems that personally I have with this theology. The first one is that it didn't start until 1830. So it's relatively new. And in Christian circles, by the way, new and novelty is not something we try to go for. You know, I'm not trying to come up and get new theology to you every week. The goal is that we want to be faithful to the teachings of Jesus and a faith that has been passed down from generation to generation. Even sometimes you hear the phrase, we just want to be an Acts 2 church. The funny thing is, I don't want to be an Acts 2 church. I want to be a 2021 church 
but I want to cling tight to the teachings of Jesus and what was happening in Acts chapter 2. Does that make sense? And so it's relatively new, so it doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong, but it, it does raise some red flags for me. The, the second problem I have with this is it, it leads very easily into escapist theology. And I don't have time to go into this. Just go back, watch YouTube, listen to the podcast, whatever. I've spent the last couple of months really emphasizing the point that Jesus did not come to rescue us out of earth and get us into heaven, but Jesus came to bring heaven to earth and to call the people to be a part of that. See, if we have this escapist theology, we think, well, everything's going to burn up anyway, right? She's going to destroy this whole place. Why care about the environment? Why care about systemic oppression? Why care about those things if this whole thing's going to burn up? And I think that's actually contrary to the message of Jesus, who has told us we should care very deeply about creation. We should care very deeply when we see people who are being mistreated and abused. And another issue that I have with it is that it teaches that at the end times, that we're actually going to reinstitute the temple and all of its sacrifices. And if that is true, then why on earth did Jesus die? If we're just going to go back to the old way, well, what on earth did Jesus die for? We talk about Jesus died, Hebrews 8, 13. He died so that the old way would be obsolete. Jesus isn't going backwards. He's going forwards. He's bringing heaven to earth. And he's asking us to be a part of that. Now, see, he almost got me preaching there. Almost. And, and, and the last thing, the last real big issue that I have with this theology is that it really has no relevance to anybody. Because even Jesus said, he doesn't know the day or the time. And there are some people who spend so much time trying to figure out the day or the time that he's coming back. And you just get so caught up in, man, I heard Obama was the Antichrist. I heard uh, Trump was the Antichrist. I've heard uh, that the UN is, is bad. Like all this stuff we get so, you can live in fear of something that was actually intended to bring hope to people who are being persecuted. And so I think with, with all good intentions, we set out to understand the book of Revelation and we get so misguided. Now, yes, there is things in here about what God is going to do at the end of, of time, but it's not, he's not asking us to look for these signs. He's saying, listen, at the end of the day, Jesus wins. And that brings hope no matter what situation we're in. Listen, if Jesus wins, then guess what? Your divorce didn't have the final word. When, when you got cancer, that wasn't the final word. When, when everything fell apart, it wasn't the final word. The message of Revelation is a message of hope. In fact, I, don't, I wish I had time, but in the rest of chapters 1, 2, and 3, it's addressed to seven different churches. And then you could do a whole series just going through each of the letters. Because each of these churches, um, uh, five of them get commended for something they're doing good, and they get rebuked for something they're doing bad. There's only two churches that don't get a rebuke. And these were two churches that were suffering under this persecution, and they remained faithful. And they were beat up. And they were tired. And they were exhausted. And John says, listen, don't give up. Keep moving forward. You're doing a great job. But for five other churches, there was some area where they compromised. Some area they cut corners because they didn't want that persecution. It got a little too real. It got a little too rough. And so, yes, Jesus commends them for some good things they did, but then he challenges them. And and I'll just leave us with this. I don't have time to go through all seven, but I actually think in what some scholars have suggested is that the American church today probably most closely mirrors the church of Laodicea. That's a fun word to say. It's the seventh and final church that gets addressed in Revelation. I want to look at it here. If I can turn there. Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. This is what Jesus says. He says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. For you say, I'm rich. I become wealthy and need nothing. And you don't realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. And what a challenging word. See, the reason that I and and others think that our church today most closely resembles this church, I'm just speaking for myself right now. It is so easy to live life and not depend on Jesus. So there's been times in my life where I had to depend on Jesus. I've shared before, I remember the day I walked into the living room at the apartment we lived in. We had 11 cents in our bank account to make it a week till payday. And I had to ask myself, how long does Frosted Flakes last? 
And honestly, it was easy to depend on Jesus then because I didn't have anything else to depend on. See, when your world falls apart, when you get that diagnosis you weren't expecting, when your kids are headed down a path that you don't understand, guess what? It's easy to depend on Jesus then. It's a lot easier for me to depend on Jesus when I have more than 11 cents in my bank account. And I'm not worried about where my next meal is coming from because I know it's at the Mexican restaurant after church. Somebody said, you always talk about Mexican in your sermons. Yes, I do. I'm unashamed of that. It's easy not to depend on Jesus when your faith doesn't ask you to be different from the world. It's easy to not depend on Jesus when you don't have to stand up and be a voice for the voiceless. It's easy not to depend on Jesus when you've got it made. And the funny thing is, isn't that what the world tells us the goal should be? You have enough money in your bank account, you never have to worry. Your kids are safe, a nice house in the suburbs, and a two-car garage. That's what the world tells us we want. And then you get there and you wake up one day and say, man, I could have this whole life without Jesus. And are you really following him if everything you had you could have without him? I'm convicted by that. How could we live a life where we're called to bring heaven to earth and yet we're so comfortable. We're neither hot nor cold. See, sometimes we think Jesus is saying, you're either with me or you're against me, but stop sitting on the fence. But that's not what he's saying. Because think about in ancient times, hot water, that's a commodity. Cold water is a commodity. He's saying, be, be useful, be doing something. Don't just be lukewarm. I always think about like chocolate milk. Did anybody get hot chocolate from Java Joy when you came in? Just a few people, anybody? Oh, there we go, all right, good, good. I love Java Joy, I love when they're here. But you get hot chocolate and it's good, right? You get chocolate milk. Do you guys remember school days where you had the square pizza and the chocolate milk? That was the day, that was the day. But that the hot chocolate's good, the cold chocolate's good, but if I had a Yoohoo sitting out here for five hours, would you touch that thing? No, why? Because it'd make you sick. And I wonder if Jesus is looking at us today and said, the way you're living your life, it's making me sick. I just gotta vomit you out of my mouth you're not being the people I've called you to be. You become comfortable. You become relaxed. It's easy to go and do the church thing, but it's a lot harder to live the church thing. And maybe today, the message that he's calling us to, stop just going to church. Let's be the church. Let's be different. I don't have time for a question, but we're going to do one anyway. That's the second service. I don't have another service to get ready for. So, all right. Is Revelation a depiction of the end times? Oh, man, you're going to make me spoil the series right here at the beginning. I'll tell you this. There are some things in Revelation where it does point to what happens at the end times. But again, the message of Revelation is a message of hope. It's a message that's going to challenge us. It's going to make us uncomfortable. And if by the question, is it a depiction of the end times? Are, are there symbols in here that represent different nations and stuff today? I find it hard to believe we're going to unpack that a little bit. But I think the message of Revelation is just as relevant to us today as it was to those first century Christians who were there when they first got this letter. And I'm excited to walk through this with you guys. And so as we kind of end this first week here, I told you I'm just laying the groundwork this week. Next week, we're gonna get into some more chapters. It's gonna be good. I can say, hey, bring a friend with you, okay? If then somebody said, man, this is an interesting series. I said, it might not be good, but it'll be interesting. I can guarantee you that. So bring a friend, but... I love the way that we end our time together after the teaching every week because it's so easy just to have a teaching and think, man, that was good. Just kind of go on about our day. But we set aside time every week to have a moment of reflection. And so there's four tables that actually have the elements of communion on them. And so if you want, you don't have to, but if you feel led in just a moment, I'm gonna pray. And, and then you can take communion. And I want you to think about this. If you're taking communion, Jesus made that sacrifice for us. And so what sacrifice is he calling us to make for him? There's also journals at the tables. And so if you're here today, I'd, I'd encourage you, grab a journal. They're, they're free. They're yours to take. And I know some of us like to process through writing things. So there's two questions I want you to wrestle with as you're taking communion, as you're writing them down. The first one is this, where have I persevered? Because I think it's easy sometimes to come to church and you leave and you're like, man, I'm a horrible person. Jesus is mad at me. Can I just be honest? you've persevered this last year. 
And think about moms. Think about all the roles you took on this past year. You became teacher. You became lunch lady. You became the bus driver. You did everything. You persevered. Man, some of you lost a loved one and you persevered. Some of you lost your job and you persevered. Some of you came under criticism unfairly and you persevered. Some friend stabbed you in the back and you persevered. It's okay to say, Jesus, where have I persevered this year? But I also want us to wrestle with the question, where have I accommodated? Where have you cut corners? What's maybe some areas in your life where you know that God's calling you to take a next step? Because I believe every person here, me included, we all have a next step to take. So I'm going to pray for us. We're going to have this time of communion, of reflection, and then we're going to continue into worship. So let me pray for us. God, we just thank you so much. I thank you that you would give us this message that challenges us, but at the same time, it comforts us. I'm thankful that you actually would communicate through ancient text to show us how we can live our lives today. God, I'm thankful for all the areas where we've persevered this past year. We could only do that through you and through your spirit. God, I also know in my own life, there's areas where I've accommodated. And I pray right now and ask for forgiveness and I ask for strength that I would correct that, I would move forward boldly, that I would be hot or cold, that I wouldn't be lukewarm. But as we leave this place, we would be a church committed to making a difference because of what you've done. In your name I pray, amen. As you feel led, you can take communion or grab a journal.